come to the Department of Medicine Grand Rounds. If you see Dr. Clay Smith, and I know he's outside, but I don't know if he's gotten in. He's already in here. So the medical students every year choose somebody from the faculty who has demonstrated outstanding teamwork, professional responsibility, and consideration for medical students, and they name him the recipient or her of the Golden Apple Award. This year's Golden Apple Award recipients chosen for our medical students is our own Clay Smith. Congratulations, Clay. Well deserved. If you know Sujit Dasanajat, who's in cardiology, he's a doctoral student there, congratulate him. He just won the Young Richard Binford Memorial Award, which is given to doctoral students who have excelled in scholarship and leadership in their chosen discipline. So congratulations to him. Now, this week was the birth back in 1654. We're going back to 1654 of Giovanni Maria Lancisci. Has anybody heard about him? He's an Italian clinician and anatomist. He was probably considered the first modern hygienist, and he was the personal physician of three popes. There were a lot of popes in those days. Uh, he obtained his MD in, seven, in 1672, just one month before he became 18 years of age. He examined a number of cases of southern death, and he published a document called De Mortu Cordis Mortibus. I like, I like to say those things, which he describes cardiac pathology. But in 1717, he actually noticed that around the city where he lived, they cleared all the swamps, and the incidence of malaria went down. So he predicted and he speculated that mosquitoes or flies would bring toxic substances from the swamps to people. This was almost 200 years before Ronald Ross from the CDC discovered that mosquitoes actually transmitted malaria. Ernest Everett Just died on this day back in 1941 at the age of 58. He was an African-American embryologist, did a lot of studies about egg fertilization, uh, and he was in 1915 the first winner of the Spingard Award or the Spingard Medal, who was the highest honor given by the NAACP because of his research. Gerdy Corey, you have to remember Gerdy Corey. Gerdy Corey died this week in 1957 at age 61. Gerdy Teresa Radnitz Corey was a Czech American born biochemist who met her husband or her husband to be when they became medical students, Carl Ferdinand Corey, in Prague. They married in 1920, moved to the United States, became citizens in 1928, and together they discovered the Cori cycle, the idea that muscle, when it becomes anaerobic, produces lactic acid, lactic goes to the liver, the liver transfers it and makes gluconogenesis, glucose goes back out and gives energy. That all was done by the Cori. She was the first female to win a Nobel Prize for medicine uh, or physiology, the third female uh, to earn it in science after Madame Curie and, of course, Irene Curie. But today is about transplantation, but so I, I, I try to give you a little bit of So today we remember in 1984, Baby Faye. You all remember who Baby Faye is? No? Okay. So Baby Faye was the first born, first newborn recipient of a cross-species heart transplant. Remember the baboon baby? Christian Slady, baboon movie. So uh, Leonard Bailey uh, talked to the mother of this uh, baby born prematurely with hypoplastic left heart. And by the 1970s, somebody had actually put in a cross-species heart into three adults, and they had not survived more than three or four days. But he speculated that a baby, a newborn baby, their immune system would be underdeveloped and therefore would tolerate a cross-species heart more. Baby lasted about 20 days. In those days, they used cyclosporin, which I think had more of an impact than the immunity of the baby. Uh, lived about 20 days and ultimately died of complications. So with that, I leave you with our special guest who will be introduced by Dr. William C. Thank you, Dr. Roman. Had a fantastic historical review for today's Grand Round. So it is my great pleasure to introduce today's Grand Round speaker, Dr. Gerhard Hildebrand, Professor of Medicine and Chief of the Division Hematology and Bone Marrow Transplantation at Markey Cancer Center University of Kentucky School of Medicine. He is a nationally and internationally known physician scientist in immunology and clinical GVHD research. Dr. Hildebrand received his medical degree in, uh, with a magna 
uh, come loud, uh, louder from uh, Johannes Gutenberg University Mainz Medical School in Germany. He completed residency in internal medicine and later hematology oncology fellowship at University of um, Regensburg in Germany as well. And later he was appointed as a faculty member in the same university with a clinical focus on bone marrow transplantation as well as hemopoietic malignancy. In 2009, he was appointed as director of the BMT program at Louisiana State University, Shreveport, as well later on um, Huntsman Cancer Institute in University of Utah School of Medicine before being appointed to his current position in February 2015 in University of Kentucky. Dr. Hildebrand is a very active in clinical and translational science research in GVHD mouse model. He successfully served as PI in many national and international clinical trial related to hemopoietic malignancy and bone marrow transplantation. The University of Kentucky and University of Louisville bone marrow transplant program are the only two fact credited adult transplant program in Kentucky. Plus, UofL has the only fact credited pediatric bone marrow transplant program in the Commonwealth of Kentucky. So we are basically 80 miles apart. And when you see these slides I prepared before the grand round, you will understand it should keep our Kentuckian medical educators like myself and physician trainee awake at the night. We may also understand that's why Dr. Hildebrand and myself believe that the greatest measure for our success of transplant program in the Commonwealth of Kentucky is simply how well we partnered. So please join me to welcome Dr. Hildebrand. The title of his talk is Acute Graft versus Host Disease After Allogeneic Stem Cell Transplantation, a long no, long battle, yet still not vanquished enemy. Dr. Roman, William, thank you very much for the uh, very kind invitation. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be here. I came here yesterday evening, and I have to say that uh, um, Louisville, at least from downtown, is certainly bigger than Lexington, as you probably all know. So uh, I was very impressed. Um, the talk today is really a clinical overview on um, preventive and therapeutic measures in graft versus host disease, because this is really still the challenge we face on a daily basis. I have nothing to disclose. Um, just a little bit of history. So it all started probably in World War II when there was a growing interest on efficient treatment against radiation damage. And in 1954, Barnes and colleagues did the first successful bone marrow transplantation in mice. In 1957, the first bone marrow transplant was done after supralethal irradiation in humans by E.D. Thomas. And in 1971, the first really reports were made on a series of patients using mesh sibling donors. At that time, really, after transplant, after cells were given, patients would succumb to a horrible disease like a vanishing syndrome, uh, which eventually is graft versus host disease. And in 1986, basically 30 years ago, successful graft versus host disease prevention was introduced by Rainer Storp who just retired recently at the Fred Hutch using metotrexate and cytosporin. When you look at this, this is 30 years ago, and you will see this actually again later. On this picture, you see really major players of transplant in this country. This is Edie Thomas here, who got the Nobel Prize in 1990, and you see Rainer Storp. Uh, once he was, I think, the second most quoted physician in, in one of those years in PubMed, so really um, present. This is the uh, annual number of transplant recipients in the United States by transplant type. And we differentiate autologous, like the from cells from yourself, and allogeneic transplant. And when you, when you follow these lines, 
there was a steep increase in autologous transplant in the late 90s, and then a sudden drop, and now a continuous increase again. And this phenomenon here is unfortunately to be explained when uh, autologous transplant, high dose chemo plus auto transplant was done for breast cancer, which eventually was abandoned based on the quality of the data and the lacking efficacy. In contrast, is a continuous increase in allogeneic transplant where you do get your cells from a different donor. Allogeneic transplant in this country is sorted by donor types. You see there's an increase, early increase of dominant transplant numbers from HLA identical siblings. Then there is an unrelated donor increase over the last years. And then here, alternative donor curves, donor sources, basically cord blood and other relative like mismatch transplantation. So these are our four groups, and I think any, any major program really mirrors those proportions to some extent. The indications for transplant um, are listed here. You see autologous transplant, as you all know probably from, from your daily practices, really the main transplant form done for multiple myeloma, allogeneic transplant is really not, um, not so, so commonly used. Um, the main indication for allogeneic transplant are the acute leukemias, which you see here, AML, ALL, and then CML, not as much anymore because we do have now tyrosine kinase inhibitors, and then there's again, there's a broad spectrum to the right. So for those who maybe, you know, just out of med school or in med school and, and joining these grand rounds, what is really hematopoietic stem cell transplantation? It's a reinfusion of hematopoietic, basically blood producing stem cells into the recipient. And the purpose has, uh, there are three purposes. One is, of course, hematopoietic recovery following chemotherapy and radiation therapy. The second one is establish immune recovery. And the third one, which is very important in the allogeneic transplant setting, is uh, basically immunologic control of residual disease and recurrent malignant cells, which we call graft versus leukemia, graft versus tumor, in fact. This one you do see only in allotransplant. Here's an overview how this works, allotransplant. You have your donor, usually your mobilized stem cells with GCSF, like a growth factor for the bone marrow, or you use bone marrow cells, and then you basically collect those stem cells, and you give them in a patient who has been pretreated with chemotherapy, with or without radiation therapy. And then over time, as you see here, recipient cells disappear, and donor cells basically grow up and establish themselves in the, in the patient. And we see tell, we call this basically timerism. And once you reach this point where the recipient has disappeared, it's, uh, and you're only donor, then you're 100% donor chimera. Why do we call it chimera? Um, also a little bit history, the chimera of Arezzo, 400 before Christ, um, was basically a thing of immortal make, not human. It was lion fronted, a snake behind, and a goat in the middle. And that has to do that when you're chimera, you have non hematopoietic cells, which are the recipient, and then you have hematopoietic cells, which are either recipient or the donor, or they're both. So up to basically three components. Here you see the clinical course. Again, first, you're 100% recipient. You get your transplant. The recipient disappears. The donor chimera part basically increases. That time you're a mixed chimera then you have full donor chimera, and then after transplant, we can use this tool to actually monitor if there's an impending relapse by basically seeing if the donor and recipient contributions shift and the patient does lose his 100% donor chimera status. Then you mix chimera again. A little bit about the human leukocyte antigen. Um, there were two things to remember. I think one is really, remember the HLA moves, and you, and you will see this in a second. And the other one is if you don't have a suitable donor, there's no allo transplant. So here's your moves, and here's your HLA system. And basically, 
the, the chromosome six carries the basically HLA, basically ABC and DR, DP, DQ, DR, class two molecule, MHC class two molecules, and then ABC are class one molecules. You see the structure for an MHC class one, basically, um, where you have like, um, let me have to show you. So this is class one, this is uh, class two. And you see here the class two molecule is two alpha chains and two beta chains. And you may recognize a little bit the moves, but then you really, for class one, I think, is quite, quite a similarity. You see your beta to microglobulin, you see your basically three alpha chains and then again, between the antlers, that's where the, where the peptide really goes. So I always think this is a nice idea to remember what this looks like. You have basically your, your molecules sticking out with your two antlers, and then that's where the normal peptide goes in through. And the indication for transplant is done. We have to type the patient with the human leukocyte antigen typing. Uh, once we really decide we want to move forward, we type the siblings. Uh, we do find a matched sibling in about 20 to 25 percent. Then we proceed with transplant. If we don't find a matched sibling, then we look for an unrelated donor. Usually we try to find an HLA matched unrelated donor, which is matched for basically a 10 out of 10 match, A, B, C, D, R, B, and D, R, Q. And then you can proceed with transplant. And then unfortunately, um, and about 20 to 20, 20, 30 percent of those patients, you don't find a matched donor. Then you can go with a haploid dentist, like a half matched donor. For example, you know, a parent or a child can do core blood transplant. And uh, depending on your ethnic, ethnic background, um, this proportion might be much higher. For the African American population, unfortunately, it's much harder sometimes to find a sibling donor, a matched, um, unrelated donor, and we use those. Um, alternative uh, resources. Um, in Kentucky, from my experience, and I talked with William yesterday a little bit, it seems to be a lot of German influence, and I'm German. There's a lot of donors from Germany here. Um, I think it's, uh, it's about an 80% chance to really find a matched donor in within two months for your patients. So clinically, a donor workup, the highest priority is your HLA match. The more you mismatch, the more graft versus host disease risk and you have and the worse your outcome. And then the second one is your CMV status plays a role. If you look here, the solid thin line is basically the donor and the recipient is negative and you do see there's hardly any CMV reactivation after transplant. And then in your thicker solid line, you see if the patient is negative and the donor is positive, which means with the transplant product, there will be some memory T cells introduced into the recipient. If there's a, you know, if there's a little better control, probably for reactivation, the risk for reactivation is reduced. And then the highest risk group is basically that group where the patient is CMV positive and the donor is actually CMV negative. So once you reactivate your CMV, it takes the donor immune cells, if they're even ready yet, to uh, mount an immune response. Another risk factor or factor to identify and look at when you select donors and you have enough donors to choose from is basically the gender of the donor. Um, if you have a male recipient and you have a female donor, there's basically an increased risk of graft versus host disease immune reaction against basically Y chromosome related antigens. So if you have a male recipient and you can choose, you really want to try to get a male donor. And then blood type plays a role. If you incorporate a major or minor mismatch, we do know that uh, basically hemoglobin Recovery is delayed and the outcome can be worse. Which cells should we use? I, I told you, showed you on the, on the initial picture that um, we, we use most often peripheral blood stem cells, which are GCSF mobilized. Uh, there's, there's several aspects of this. One is probably as practical, you know, no one really wants to go to the OR and harvest bone marrow cells, but that's not all. I mean, there's data that you're 
engraftment is a little bit faster. Your neutrophils engraft a little bit faster. Your platelets engraft a little bit faster. Your immune reconstitution is faster. Your graft brothers host disease, your acute graft brothers host disease, um, is probably not so different. The studies are conflicting. The chronic graft brothers host disease is a little bit decreased with bone marrow cells based on one paper I'll show you in a second, which was published I think in 2012. And then, but there's also conflicting data, and, and, and it's really, um, I think, uh, um, still has in practice changed to go to bone marrow relief ERQ with <coughs> peripheral blood stem cells more. Overall survival may be a little bit better with peripheral blood stem cells, but as I'll show you in a second, also this is, again, very study specific. So here you see the New England paper from 2012 published by Anasetti, and they compared basically in several thousand patients um, peripheral blood versus bone marrow stem cells. And really the overall survival is, in my opinion, very similar. Um, the cumulative incidence of non-relapse-related death, which means not the malignancy takes a patient's life, but it's uh, really toxicity in the end is very similar. Um, the disease-free survival is very similar, and the cumulative incidence of relapse is also very similar. What is different here is you basically, most importantly, a cumulative incidence of chronic graft host disease, which I don't talk about now, but for, for those who, who have seen transplant patients, if you develop chronic graft host disease, um, this really um, does affect your life quality substantially, and it is a, it is a significant contributor to um, chronic morbidity and unfortunately also eventually to mortality. And uh, if you can reduce chronic graft versus host disease, it's certainly good for the patient from a life, pers life, life quality perspective, but then there might be other things. You lose your graft versus leukemia effect. Again, when you look at different studies, it's, it's not not a clear cut. So as shown by Bipin Zavani from Vanderbilt, um, who looked uh, into basically only AML patients, and he could really show that with bone marrow there was an increased incidence of relapse, there was a decreased leukemia-free survival, and then there was decreased graft versus host disease. So really, in AML, I think you have to think, do you really want to use bone marrow? Because actually in AML, your, your leukemia control might be a little bit inferior. So what is really this, uh, this graft versus host disease? So classically, it was defined as an immune reaction of the donor immune cells against the recipient tissues, which occurred within the first 100 days. This has changed. We now separate this not so much by days after transplant, but rather by the clinical picture. Acute graft versus host disease is a trial of dermatitis, enteritis, and liver basically damage with either a heliostatic form or a hepatitic form uh, of a graft, acute graft versus host disease. And then the fourth organ, which I always say, is a lung. We do know that there is some increased acute severe lung injury. Um, we call it like idiopathic pneumonia syndrome, um, where, where there is certainly a toxicity component to it and an alloreactive T-cell component. And then the immune and hematopoietic system are also targets of graft versus host disease. So when you have your survivors after transplant and they have acute graft versus host disease, you can actually see a dip in your count, which is most likely interferon gamma and TNF-mediated suppression of your marrow function. Um, despite our HLM matching efforts, um, this is, I think, a very positive statement. 30 to 40 percent of all HLA match recipients get acute CVHD. This is really more like acute graft versus host disease, grade two and above. In total, it's up to 60 percent. And when you get that, you have secondary problems, which you talk about later, related to infection. This is a pathophysiology. It's a, it's a, the wheel of Ferrara. Jamie Ferrara was at the uh, University of Michigan. It's not Mount Sinai. And he developed this concept how acute graft versus host disease really develops. So this first, you can see conditioning related tissue damage in the patient, which results on the one side 
to translocation of LPS, like danger signals, yeah, pumps and dumps. Um, and then on the other side, you have a production of inflammatory cytokines. So, so what, what do they do? They then activate your recipient antigen-presenting cells. They then activate donor T cells, naive donor T cells. They proliferate, mature, get an effector function, and then basically either a CD8 or CD4 cells result in organ injury. On top of it, they cross prime macrophages, which are also activated by LPS, and then have a cytokine release, and uh, those cytokines are known to drive graft versus host disease as well. These are some good guys, regulatory T cells. They inhibit basically donor T cell proliferation and expansion, and they're now currently in clinical practice to see if that really pans out clinically. Very briefly, other risk factors, again, of course, HL disparity, the T cell number in your transplant inoculum, the more T cells you give, the more graft-versus host disease you could get. The toxicity, the higher the toxicity, the more tissue injury you get. Graft-versus host disease prophylaxis, we'll be talking a second about. And then the other risk factors are really, you know, uh, ongoing infections, concurrent infections, gender mismatch, as I mentioned. Polymorphisms have been studied quite a bit. There's a lot of data out there that certain polymorphisms uh, of both recipient and donor um, affect your, your transplant outcome. In reality, I think I, I feel comfortable to say that the, from a patient side, we cannot modulate and affect it at all. And from a donor side, uh, do you really have enough donors when you take the more dominant uh, selection parameters um, to really then look at polymorphisms? We are not there yet. These are not incorporated into any um, like donor selection processes. The microbiome is emerging as a, as a big driver of graft versus host disease. Marcel van der Brink at Memorial Sloan Kettering is working on that extensively. And they could show, for example, that if you give Zosin for neutropenic fever, your risk of graft versus host disease goes up. So you better advise to use cefepime. I think it's a very, you know, very practical um, um, information because uh, I can only say when I trained in Germany, we would always use Zosin. We would never use cefepime because that was a belief that Zosin is better. And now we know it probably wasn't better. We should have used cefepime. And it's, it's an easy, easy factor, actually, to modulate transplant outcome. And then the recipient age, of course, does play a role. Um, seems that uh, older antigen-presenting cells uh, are more capable of driving immune responses. This is data from Dr. Orderman uh, in the mouse. Um, and uh, I think it's... Uh, it's a reasonable data as an underlying uh, um, explanation. So for the clinician, how does this present? So most commonly, and usually first, you have graft-versus-host disease of the skin. And it comes really around your engraftment a few days after. And patients develop a maculopapular rash, you know, the palms and soles of their feet, you know, the palms of their hands, they get like reddish. They get this rash, they start itching and start scratching themselves. Then uh, you should start your topical steroids for them, your systemic steroids. But if you don't, you know these lesions will be confluent, you will develop bulla, and then you would come to a very severe state. Uh, fortunately, I think if you start early, you hardly see this in the clinic. Um, differentials are drug induced skin rash, viral exanthema, or like drug, like toxicity effects. Um, the skin biopsy we try to obtain, but often the result is a little bit ambiguous. You know, you say, well, clinical correlation indicator could be graft versus host disease, but could be basically everything else. So it's a clinical, in my opinion, more clinical decision. Um, also important, hepatic or intestinal graft versus host disease really rarely occurs in the complete absence of prior or concurrent skin GVHD. So sometimes if you see suddenly a bilirubin increase or transaminitis, and you have no clinical signs of skin GVHD, you really put some other differentials in your list. So the liver is the second most involved target organ. And uh, the, the predominant presentation is cholestasis and jaundice. Um, it comes to a bile duct uh, destruction. And then there's also sometimes a hepatitis-like form 
we have predominant transaminitis, but in the end, the most common cause for transaminitis increase early after transplant are your pasimmune inhibitors and not Zafra's host disease. The liver is very patient. I always say it's a very patient organ. You, you, you know, the hepatologist knows this much better than me. You only need a certain amount of your liver tissue to survive. And really, um, I think dying from liver failure due to graft versus host disease is rather not so common. From a differential perspective, the, the main differential is renal occlusive disease in the early phase. And basically, you have weight gain, you have pain, like liver pain, ascites. And that is important because severe venal occlusive disease, where the little venules of the liver basically um, occlude, uh, is associated with a very high mortality. Other differentials are listed here, and I think you probably can read through the slides. I have a printout, or if it stays online, I don't know. Acute graft versus host disease in the gut. We differentiate upper GI tract and lower GI tract graft versus host disease. The symptoms are, as you expect, you know, anorexia, you know, food intolerance, hemophagastic pain, nausea, vomiting, and then the lower GI tract, diarrhea, and abdominal cramps. Um, there is a syndrome which is isolated upper GI. I don't think I have a slide in here on this. An isolated upper GI tract GVHD, which you really have to consider uh, to work up after transplant. Um, in case patients, for example, around the engraftment period after that persistently don't want to eat. And we always say, well, this is, might be mucositis resolving the drugs they have to take now, but it could be also graft versus host disease. This is a slide which I thought was very interesting, which looks at the yield, basically, of uh, biopsies for GI tract GVHD, um, basically based on the site of the biopsy and if you really can basically identify, um, and basically based on the symptoms, your, your graft versus host disease. And if you, for example, if you have diary, watery, watery diarrhea, bloody diarrhea, if you would do a stomach biopsy, there's still a 64% positive yield. If you have a nausea, vomiting, which is more upper GI tract, when you basically biopsy in the left colon, then uh, basically um, you have a 61% positivity. And if you take all these percentages together, right now I think we, we feel comfortable to say that your primary form of uh, endoscopy is probably a flex sick rather than really you really don't have to do a pan colonoscopy. And uh, if, you, if you have severe upper GI symptoms, you can do an EGD on top. We stage graft versus host disease by severity. I don't go through this. You have your different extent of your rashes, your liver dysfunction, and your diarrhea amount. Um, everyone gets a stage. Then together, we come up with a grade. This is all very theoretical. But if you look clinically at outcomes, and this is data from 2005, if you look at this, this is your group of patients who develop acute graft versus host disease, grade four, who really, at one year after transplant, have a very poor survival chance. Basically, if they get acute graft versus host disease, they, they, they die very, very, very rapidly and fast. Um, and then with grade three, the similar thing, you have about a two-year survival of a little less than 25 to 30%. And then grade one, grade zero, and grade two are basically are not significantly different. So really, three and four, you really are scared of as a transplant physician and as a patient, because this really affects your outcome dramatically. So, so all these, these, these grades were derived from clinical you know, symptoms and findings and lab markers. And then Jamie Ferrara and his group published in Lancet in 2015, the Ann Arbor graft versus host disease score, which is a biomarker score. And I think I'm going to go quickly through this, because this is very interesting. So these are patients who are grade one from the basically grading system I just showed you. And you would think they should all be fine. But if you look through this, there are still patients with an ABA biomarker score 
have a high Ann Arbor biomarker score and have significant mortality, but it has a low Ann Arbor score, and they have actually low mortality. And if you go to the other extreme, which I showed you, Glucksberg 3, like basically grade 3, with significant mortality, you do see that there's a proportion who has a low Ann Arbor score and actually does much better. I think what this really tells us is that the clinical findings, they're helpful, but they're not everything. And that is probably a subpopulation which benefits of a more aggressive first-line approach or a preventive approach even in those where we would always say otherwise, yeah, this is grade one, this is fine, you know, this is not so bad. Um, so there's a subpopulation which may, may can be treated in a, in a better way. And I know that uh, they're working on a clinical trial looking exactly into this, giving high and arbor three patients with, uh, with, uh, with a high, high risk, basically, across all Glucksburg um, scales to basically preventively treat them. This year, it's just the overall one, two mortality, putting this, that's just the upper curve here, as a comparison in here. And you see the difference here, 60%, and here we at 20%. Whereas here, you see 3, 4, about 56%, but then there are patients who only have about 20, 15, 20% mortality. So let's go back to, to cyclosporin and metotrexate. Calcineurin inhibitor and metotrexate, plus minus ATG, has been the standard for graft versus host disease prevention for decades. And nothing so far has been proven better. That's basically the message. We have no randomized trial which really showed that over the 30 years with all what we try, we have really significantly improved. There are a lot of tests being done. There's T-cell depletion, CD34 like stem cell enrichment. There's alemtuzumab, CD52 antibody, who basically was called as a mini, mini bomb for the immune system, kind of blades the immune system. And now maybe with, with post-transplant cyclophosphamide, this will change where we don't use actually, or we don't, we try to avoid long-term immunosuppression after transplant, but we give actually a chemo drug um, on day three and day four after transplant. And this is the data for this, and I don't go through everything, but you really can see that especially chronic graft versus host disease seems to be reduced significantly with post-transplant cyclophosphamide. Um, it's really uh, down from, from 50%, basically. And then acute graft versus host disease is, is really not uh, significantly increased. It's actually low with around 20%, grade 3, grade 4. Um, the, again, the, the interesting part here is that you give you cyclophosphamide, and then you're done with it. There's no more, no more tacrolimus. There's no more long-term immunosuppression, and the idea is that you eliminate with the cyclophosphamide early, rapidly expanding uh, alloreactive T cells. And the regulatory T cells, which were the good guys on the, on the wheel, they actually survive the cyclophosphamide based on uh, in, in, intrinsic factors of overexpression of certain enzymes. Um, um, the other one are HDEG inhibitors. Vorinostat has been tested by the Michigan group um, as part of the prevention protocol. Excellent outcomes in this basically early trial. Certainly something we can uh, follow up on. Interestingly, CCR5 blockade, basically targeting the chemokine receptor 5, um, has very good data. Um, also, this uh, is something which uh, is being followed up on. And um, that's why I point this out. T-cell depletion, like stem cell enrichment, yeah, T-cell free transplant is being compared currently with uh, um, post-transplant cyclophosphamide in the BMTCTN1203. And then, uh, hold on, this is mixed up. The Maraviroc and the Botizumab is, uh, is compared in the 1203, which is, uh, which is a reduced intensity graft versus host disease prophylaxis trial, has three arms, has post-transplant cyclophosphamide, CCR5 blockade, and Velcade. And 1301 is a calcineurin inhibitor-free uh, trial where we try to get rid of tacrolimus or cyclosporin. 
um, which is uh, CD34 enrichment or also post-transplant cyclophosphamide. At UK, we have the second trial open. In Utah, where I worked before, we had the 1203 trial open. Um, these are, these are, I think, really important trials to see what do these uh, single arm clinical phase, that like, like phase two studies really, uh, really bring to the bed at the end of the day. Preclinical approaches for GVHD prevention, there's a lot of things being tested. Um, I don't go through this. Uh, we have a graph for this whole series research lab at UK where we right now look at several things, including neutrophil depletion and uh, the use of curcumin. Uh, I show you here our published data on the uh, neutrophils in graft by this host disease. And what you see here is an upregulation of LY6G, which is expressed on neutrophils. It's, an, it's basically a key surface antigen of neutrophils. And you see it's highly expressed in the terminal ileum at 48 hours. And then here you see also on an RNA level an upregulation we used a depleting antibody. We reduced um, LY6G antibody. We could show in our mice that basically giving this antibody results in a depletion of neutrophils in a, in a mouse, basically, of circulating neutrophils. And then we used this antibody in a transplant model, and we gave this antibody early after transplant. And you see that in the syngenics groups, um, all animals survived, and then we did it in a German facility with my friend Robert Seiser, and uh, we did it here in the United States in our lab, and we could see basically that if you give this anti-LY6G antibody and you deplete neutrophils early, you have an improved overall survival. We looked at pathology early on after transplant. There was less gut injury, there was less liver injury, and uh, that was, uh, I think, very promising. We tested this and, and proved this with several different um, mechanisms. We used mice, which couldn't generate myeloperoxidase in neutrophils. Um, we used the uh, homing problems of neutrophils, blocking the migration of neutrophils. I mean, the manuscript was published, I thought, for, for the audience. This might not be so, so interesting. I think one thing is also we, we labeled basically E. coli with uh, paramagnetic uh, beads and then could show by MRI how these uh, E. coli translocate during the early phase after transplant to the gut barrier and drive graft for this host disease. The other project we look at is curcumin, and I think curcumin is a very unbeloved uh, molecule of compound in, at the NIH. It's very hard to get funding, I think, for curcumin. But really, if you look at the, what, what curcumin affects here and what I told you, it really affects it you know, several pathways, TNF, and kappa B, COX-2, um, IL-6 is a target, you know, STAT-3. So many, many pathways which are involved in graft versus host disease prophylaxis, uh, pro graft versus host disease pathophysiology are actually targeted by curcumin. So we did a mouse experiment where we basically gave mice curcumin from day minus 5 to day 7. And when you look here, these are your syn controls which don't have graft versus host disease. It's basically the same mouse strain. And then here, your allo controls, which die from graft versus host disease. And then you have your curcumin-treated group, which has a significant, significant um, improved survival. And then you have a decrease in serum cytokines for TNF, interferon gamma, IL-6, known drivers of graft versus host disease. And you have a difference in gut pathology not so much in lung and liver. So really what, what the curcumin does most likely is really blocking the early alloreactive conditioning driven damage in the gut. Um, so, so basically the idea is really to use this in a preventive approach. It's very tempting and we are working on a, a clinical trial right now with a company to have a better bioformulation, to have better delivery to the gut because that's always the criticism you get um, with curcumin. And then in vitro, you see how curcumin in a dose-dependent fashion reduces T-cell expansion uh, to CD3, CD28 stimulation, and in an MLR, you see a suppression of cytokines. Now, this is really more data which you, which you contribute to the manuscript in the end to publish uh, the mechanism. And you see 
that is the suppression of phosphorylated STAT3 and the suppression of NF kappa B, so there's really less inflammation with bucurcumin. And this is a polycurcumin which we use. We work with an offspring company from UK, and we tested it in vitro, and we see very similar effects. So this is now hopefully going to the next step. So just on the prevention of graft versus host disease, um, neutrophil depletion and interference with neutral migration and oxidative birth reduce graft versus host disease. And if you guys really, really paid attention, it's probably not pointed out by me, um, these are basically recipient neutrophils, interestingly. And how this really works out in the clinical setting, you know, when you have a conditioning regimen which may go over several days, and do recipient neutrophils really play a role still then, or are all gone by then? Um, we first thought, we don't know, we tested in the mouse, we do actually have data that the later time points also, donor neutrophils play a role, and that project is about to be completed and submitted, where we can show that donor neutrophil depletion at a later time point actually does also reduce graft versus host disease. And then curcumin, I showed you what we do in the lab and our, our direction where we go from here. And again, there's so many preclinical studies out there on reduction in graft versus host disease. We could talk two days in a row about this, so I, I go now over to treatment. For the clinicians in the room, the topical treatment is really cortisone creams for skin GVHD, budesonide for the lower GI tract, beclometasone for the upper or lower GI tract, depends how it's formulated. And then if you have really grade two graft versus host disease, prednisone, one to two milligram per kick, standard of care, um, also hasn't changed over many, many years. Um, that's just your first line treatment. And then second line, um, the same thing. There's a, lot of, there's a lot of approaches, but we always have a response rate of around probably 30%, 30 to 40%, and then the response is temporary. Some of those patients are progressing and these are, it's like, like dealer's choice, I always say, you know, and I think a program should just develop an algorithm, what they, what they want to use as a first, second line add-on. Um, and I can go through this. I personally, I strongly favor ECP because of the toxicity profile. And I know that um, I talked with William about it. I think both programs, we have the, uh, we have the uh, ability we have the hardware, basically, but it's still not active. And I think uh, just as a plea for, uh, I think for our patient, I think both programs should really work on this to get this going because I think it's, it's, it's really a good uh, method for, for, for graft versus host disease, second-line treatment. Um, and and the, the reason is really you don't have such a severe immunosuppression like you have with TNF blockade where you see a lot of infections, MMF, has a, has a, you know, gut toxicity, ATG, depletes your T cells entirely. Um, so kind of, kind of suddenly, boom, you had risk for CMV reactivation, EBV reactivation. Campus basically exacerbates that, that phenotype of clinical course, and the risk of infections is even higher. There is now very promising data on a ruxoloctinib, um, basically JAK2 inhibitor, on a, on a, in steroid refractory graft versus host disease. Robert Sider presented that at ASH last year um, and they published it also in leukemia. It's a patient series, multi-center, uh, with very good response rates. Um, the clinical trials are basically starting now, and uh, I think that is that is really probably a good, good option too. And the mesenchymal stem cells have been first reported by Catherine and LeBron uh, in the Karolinska Institute, which is basically a mesenchymal stem cell with, which does not really have, uh, you know, MHCs. It's basically immunology, not immunolo immunologically not necessarily a target or driver of T cell uh, um, responses, but has more like a healing function and a quenching function for inflammatory cytokines. Um, it was very promising, and I, I remember this very well because we also wanted to join the trial with this at that time, and Unfortunately, the trial hasn't, hadn't reached the benchmark uh, reduction in graft Q graft versus host disease, but it's still being looked at because the trial was maybe not also the, the end point, were not really chosen too wisely. So, so I think uh, mesenchymal stem cells still 
under investigation was a very reasonable um, option. So we tested our cocomine also in the treatment setting based on the, its effects on the cytokine production like TNF and T cell function. So we basically transplanted our animals and gave it from day 14 to day 28. And that's pretty impressive. Uh, we really see again a very, a very good separation of the survivor curve in the cocomine treated and the non cocomine treated groups. And the funny thing is, well, it's not funny, but the, 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 the observation you make is once you stop your curcumin, actually, the, 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 the groups died again. So it's really a temporary, you know, survival benefit. And uh, so, so we basically uh, um, feel that if you give this long term, you might have, a, we might have a clinical benefit for patients. This is all right now with a better, better formulation focus of what we do because it's relatively cheap, it's relatively non-toxic, and um, that's where we're at there. So, so having talked about graphic host disease, I'm going to spend the last five minutes and then I'm done. Um, um, on, on, on really the dark side of transplant, which I did, and now on the good side of transplant. So dark side of transplant, I always say graft versus host disease. The good side is really that we can control malignancy. So this is basically the T-cell dilemma of allotransplant. You have your lymphocytes, they cause your gut GVHD, your skin GVHD, your liver GVHD, and your lung injury, and cause uh, morbidity and mortality. But then at the same time, those lymphocytes control malignancy. One is graft versus host disease, one is graft versus leukemia. Is this a real phenomenon or is this just a wish? If you look at this old data um, from the CMTR, you see here two diseases, AML transplanted in first remission and CML patients transplanted in chronic phase. And we have four groups. And this is a incidence of relapse, and here you have patients who developed, got an allotransplant, did develop graft versus host disease, and that was their relapse rate. In red, you see the patients had an allotransplant, but they did not have graft versus host disease, and they had a higher relapse risk. And then if you T-cell deplete your product, then your relapse risk goes even up. So, so if you think about this now, why well, didn't you just say that you have CD34 enriched stem cells in clinical trials? Yes, we do, and, uh, and I think in the end, the overall survival is a combination of graft versus host disease and relapse. But just from a GVL effect, if you have T cells in your product, you're better off than if you don't. And if you take a syndronic transplant, an identical sibling, um, identical twin, then uh, the relapse risk is higher. So there is a graft versus host disease associated graft versus leukemia effect. And this is just some examples how this pans out clinically. These are patients with advanced leukemia who got a transplant. If they got a T cell depleted product, relapse risk was much higher. Yeah. Um, the same here um, in this one, non T cell depleted, T cell depleted. Um, and here you have your overall survival, leukemia free survival here. Um, basically, um, again, very different if you have a T cell depleted product versus a non T cell depleted product. So there is graft versus leukemia for sure. It is probably not the same for every disease, um, but, but again, if you have a high risk patient, then you, you should think about this to utilize this. So if you have a high risk patient, really, um, if you have a high-risk patient for graft versus host disease or transplant-related mortality, so someone who is maybe from his leukemia risk standard but has a lot of comorbidities and you don't want to lose the patient from toxicity, then you give a T-cell depleted product or you reduce the intensity of the conditioning. If you have a high-risk disease, and I, I would never do T-cell depletion, I wouldn't use ATG either, I would really take the risk of developing graft versus host disease to have some control. And then, of course, our real wish is the separation of GVHD and GVL. And this has been reported in mouse studies. We all know the articles, you know, we reduce GVH, but we maintain GVL. There's always some caution to this because these are mouse models with certain setups. It's not 
for the real world. But we do know that uh, regulatory T cells may be able to do so either if we expand them in vivo and then ex vivo and then give them, if we basically induce them in vivo, like with Evermycin or Atra and ECP. So basically, you induce regulatory T cells, the good guys. Um, and reduce basically or basically reduce the course of GVHD. Or can we eliminate basically GVHD reactive T cell subpopulation? Can we give a product where we take out naive T cells and then uh, maybe keep CMV reactive memory T cells, EBV specific memory T cells in it, just like a tailored approach? Um, this has been tested. And then there is data for hypermethylating agents and HDAG inhibitors. Like for hypermethylating, like by days after transplant, metacytidine, um, for isocytidine, which is by days is the, basically the, the, of the, the commercial name, um, and you could see that we do induce after transplant alloreactive CD8 positive killer cells, T cytotoxic T cells, but then at the same time, we also induce regulatory T cells. So you really, you really work on both sides. You know, you induce CD8 T cells to control your possible relapse, but then you have induction of T-Rex to downregulate graft graft host disease. Um, that's really what it is. I think uh, it's a very complex, um, complex uh, field. Um, it's not, not only steroids. Unfortunately, steroids don't do it. It's a horrible drug. I see this too often that patients are kept on steroids for too long. If they don't respond, so, you know, people give them more steroids and more steroids. It just doesn't work. You know, if you don't respond to steroids, you have to come up with alternatives. Toxicity is, uh, is tremendous. I would like to thank a few people. Um, I think most of all, my lab, of course, Dr. Palanyandi, uh, Dr. Kumari, and Nashwan Jabur, um, who work in my lab right now, and then uh, Dr. Kessler at UK, who does mouse pathology for us, Elizabeth Huber, who was actually a, a medical student when I was a uh, myself a fellow in Germany, at that time I kind of pulled her into graft virus host disease, and she really established herself, herself as a mouse graft versus host disease expert in Europe now, so she, she does a lot of my pathology. Um, I would like to thank uh, Robert Seiser for the collaboration on our neutrophil story, which, which really I think was, uh, was very exciting for us. And then UK, Dr. Dr. Moliterno from the Department of Medicine as my chairman, who really supports my lab and our clinics that grows um, tremendously. Dr. Deininger in Utah, my former mentor uh, clinically, then Dr. Boyer, Dr. Jamie Ferrara, I mentioned, Franz Hollard, Ken Cook, all people who I think without their support, I wouldn't do what I do right now. And uh, I'm really appreciative of this. And I think always, you know, when you're young and you're wild and you, you, you feel sometimes, you know, cut off by your mentors and babysitted by a mentor. This goes more to the residents and fellows. I think once you get older and you're, you're suddenly alone somewhere and you're responsible of a transplant program, you really do realize uh, how much you learn from good mentors. And, uh, and uh, I think everybody is a little rebel at some point. But once you get a bit more and more older, then you really value um, every minute you had with a good mentor. And then I would like uh, to thank basically all the institutions who supported me and my research and then the German Cancer Foundation uh, for, uh, for basic support over many years as well. So um, any questions? Thank you. Uh, so this is a fascinating area that is still evolving, but I, I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit. You told us about the contribution of the neutrophil and graft versus host. Is there a contribution of the neutrophil in graft versus leukemia? So we haven't tested this yet. Um, so I, I really cannot comment on this. Um, we haven't tested this uh, because this, this Nature Medicine project was recipient neutrophils, which uh, in the, uh, in the uh, clinical relevance, we, I myself am critical how, how this pans out. But then now we have donor neutrophil data where we see donor neutrophils uh, really in the gut, for example, driving graft versus host disease. Could there be a role? Maybe if there's any, you know, myeloperoxidase driven, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a neutrophil traps, this network they create, could it help 
but I have no, no data. What's the CCR5? CCR5? Yeah, so basically, um, we, we do know that started out with the, uh, with the HIV patient in, uh, in uh, Hanover, when, uh, in uh, Berlin, in Berlin, where they transplanted him, and uh, based on the, the beneficial effects of this CCR5 mutation, um, they, they, they decided to transplant, the donor, they decided to transplant him because uh, the virus couldn't enter the T cells. We do have uh, mouse data, actually, which I published a few years ago with the MIP1 alpha and runtees, like uh, chemokines, which are basically ligands to CCR5 and CCR1. And in the mouse model, you could also see there's less graft versus host disease based on T-cell migration, yeah. Um, so, so the clinical trial, um, the, 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 the single arm study was promising that the patients did better. The BMT CDN1203 is comparing this right now. I think they're done with recruitment now. I, I didn't because I left Utah, and I think when I left, there were 50% accrual was done. So the data should come out in some one of the next years. But we don't have a comparison to others. You know, I think it's, uh, I think the benchmark is still high with, uh, with, uh, and in that study, the, the control arm is interesting. So you have three arms. You have Belcade, you have CCR5 blockade, and you have post transplant cyclophosphamide. And the control actually is historic uh, tacrolimus steroids. And then the goal is once you have one of these three as a winner, then the plan is to have a one to one comparison to really prove something is better than that. And uh, it's a long, long way. It's oral. I've seen it popping up in, in multiple heart groups who are trying to. It's a drug trying to find a, a target. Well, that's I think the, the critique you get. You know, it's yeah. a, it's a, it's a big wash, and uh, so so um, that's um, why if you put curcumin in your NIH proposal, I think uh, I don't know, but I think a lot of the reviewers they see the word and then they just throw it out, I and uh, and uh, yeah. it's not good. But one point, so in our lab, that's why what we do is we now basically use, basically, quant like look at specific curcumin pathways, and then what we do is we test those separately. So just to, to find out. Because I, I really, I have this concern myself that yeah. funding for curcumin is uh, tricky, yeah. very tricky. Well, listen, we want to take you home with a Louisville plug. You can't display this very often at UK because of the rivalry, but... <laughs> <laughs> if it's a basketball, that's a no-no. If it's a football, it's a no-no. But baseball, there's not a lot of rivalry between the two organizations. So, Georg Lugelmann, Medicine Grand Island, University of Louisville, October 27, 2016. Thank well, you so much. Thank you. That's very nice. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.